Well, hello and welcome to the Glow Church online stream. Wherever you are around the world, we are so thankful that you've joined us today. It is the month of November. And so here at Glow Church, we celebrate what we like to call November rain. And part of that November rain experience this year, we've reached out to some of the creatives in our church. Liz, tell us about it. Yeah, well, we've, uh, we just want to shout out all our amazing artists in our church who have volunteered to donate their work um, to create this beautiful display uh, and showcase the creativity in our church and really the heart of God um, uh, to our church as well. So it's been really beautiful. Some people have even been crying as they've been walking through the art displays as they read the blurbs of what God's shown people as they've painted or crafted these pictures. So thank you artists, you're amazing for blessing our church. So. Real quick story, someone who painted a prophetic piece of art yeah. showed it to their connect group during the week and someone they didn't know said that's the exact experience that I was going through a few years ago. So it was actually a prophetic picture for someone three years later that really blessed their heart. And so we're excited about what God's doing. Today we're hearing from our senior pastor, Pastor Joel. So let's get in and hear a great message from Pastor Joel. Would you join me in welcoming everyone online for November rain? Come on, so glad you're joining us. For those of you maybe who are unwell, maybe you're traveling for business, maybe you've been joining us because you're just intrigued to see what God's doing through Glow Church. We are so glad you're joining us in this very unique month. And can I encourage you, if you are living on the Gold Coast or in any of our cities actually, and you are free at 7 p.m. tonight, come and join us as we seek the presence of God in a unique way. You are welcome. You cannot get that online. I am convinced of it. You need to be in the space when the Spirit of God moves. Well, in the Bible, there are a number of stories and there are a number of um, chapters and even books dedicated to people having encounters with the presence of God on mountaintops. So often we can hear or think through the thought of mountaintops and valleys. But I see in the Word of God, there is so much symbolic nature of a mountaintop reflecting the presence of God. So many times someone would go up to the mountain and they would have an encounter with God that was unique to anything that was happening on the ground or in a valley. And maybe you might in your heart be like, man, this season I'm in, it doesn't feel like a mountaintop. It feels more like I'm in a valley right now. Or maybe at the moment you've felt a bit comfortable or stagnant in your faith. Or maybe you're in church for the first time going, something has got to change in my life because right now I feel like there is something that is missing. Well, in the Bible, we see on so many occasions the presence of God invading people's circumstances and lives when they were willing to go up to the top of the mountain, when they were willing to leave the valley and say, I will pursue His presence. At the start of this month, I wonder if we'd be willing to be spiritual mountain climbers. If we would put aside the concerns of the world or the things that are challenges and say, what would it look like to let go of a whole lot of stuff, to live light in order to go up and meet Him in His presence? What would it look like to have to be uncomfortable in our time, uncomfortable in our circumstances to say, some things just don't matter right now and I just need one touch from the presence of God. I need an infusion of the Spirit of God. I am running dry and I need a river to flow once again. If you're here this morning in the room and you say, you know what, I want a fresh touch from God, I want you to take five seconds right now and I want you to praise God in this place right now. Come on, give Him a clap offering. Say, God, I am expectant for Your presence in my life. I'm ready for a fresh encounter on the mountaintop. You know, Noah's Ark rested on the top of Mount Ararat, 4,000 metres above sea level. And it's in that moment that God speaks to Moses as the Creator and says, I am going to give you a covenant that I will never ever destroy the earth ever again, like you've just seen with the whole planet being wiped out. We see Moses on the top of Mount Horeb. He didn't know God. He was a murderer. And yet there is God waiting in the form of a burning bush to encounter Moses and speak the promise, say, set my people free. You might be here today, you might be watching online going, well, this must be only for Christians. No, it's not. God wants to meet you where you're at. God wants to speak to you. God wants to change your life forever. We also see Moses went back up the mountain at Mount Sinai where he received the 10 commandments or the rules for living or the, the frameworks for life for God's people. We also saw the, in that story, the lightning and the, 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 the cloud. And as Moses went up, the Bible says that his face shone. 
we see the ultimate showdown of Elijah up against 450 prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel, where God comes in all his power and confounds those that did not believe in him. It's at Mount Moriah we see Abraham at the top of the mountain preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac. And out of nowhere, God provides a solution and provides the answer and speaks and says, stop. Joshua, with God's people, is standing at the top of Mount Ebal. It's where God speaks to them and blesses them and said, you will go and you will inherit the land. Jesus himself spoke his most significant message, the, the Beatitudes you can find in the book of Matthew. Where was that? The Sermon on the Mount. It didn't happen in the valley, it happened on the mountain. We also know that Jesus, in going to the cross for you and I, is described as the place of Golgotha, or some say it was the hill of Golgotha, but really it was in the, the, the mountaintop there in Mount Zion. It was a place where you had to look up to see what God was doing. Jesus went to the most painful moment of his life to speak volumes for thousands of years to every believer. It's also at the top of Mount Olives where Jesus ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And can I declare this morning the same place that he will return to as he comes back in his second coming. And I want to encourage you believers, be reading your Bible right now because there is a lot going on there. And he will return not into the valley, but he will return to the top of the mountain. And there are so many examples where God himself and Jesus and the Spirit of God ministers to people when they were willing to climb the mountain and go up to that place to say, I am willing to let go to go up. Listen to me at the start of November, what are you willing to let go of to go up? What are you willing to say right now in my life, it doesn't matter what's going on, I need to lose a few things in order for God to encounter me afresh because I can't go where God's calling me to, well, I'm weighed down. I wanna pick up this morning another story because there's so many of them on the mountaintop and I pray it encourages you. If you've got your Bible, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. We're going to go to verse 1. I know everyone online there's already got it ready because you're overachievers, but those of us that are in the room, maybe you did bring the Bible. If you brought a Bible this morning, give it a wave. Come on, give it a wave so I can see it. You are very, very good Christians. Well done. A lot of phones went up just then. Yeah, I I see it. I see it. You didn't want to be left behind. I get it. However, you need to read the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Matthew 17, we see another mountaintop experience is where we're going to land today. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Let me say that again. And he led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, It is good for us to be here, but if you wish, I will put up three shelters or three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. We see another story of God himself encountering his son Jesus on a mountaintop. They had to go away from the people. They had to go away from the circumstances. They had to go up to a place to get away from the valley in order for God to move in such a unique way. I personally am not a mountain climber. I don't claim to be the sort of person who'd be down at EMF in the hyperbaric chamber training in any way, shape or form to climb a significant mountain. But that's just not me personally. Uh, that's probably because I have asthma and uh, it's a believing for a healing, but it's been a long time since I was a little kid having asthma. And so high environments aren't good for asthmatics because of the Ill- Ill- inability to breathe. But I... I will tell you a time that I did climb here in Australia what is like a mountain and it was before it was closed to the public, just FYI for those online that don't want to hate on me, and I climbed Mount, uh, not Mount, I climbed Ez Rock. Ez Rock is an amazing, amazing place. We honour that area of our nation. When you fly over it, it is quite significant. They call it the heart of the nation. 
And at the time, Ellen was, uh, she was my wife, and uh, I'm not sure why I didn't say that, but we were newly married, and we had, well, actually, no, we'd been married for a few years, but we had a brand new baby. Taylor was only probably nine months old, and so uh, my biggest memory of that time in, over there in Ezrock was having to buy a new pram when we got back because the red soil destroyed the pram. And so if you're ever going to the red outback, don't take a pram because you'll be buying a new one. You're welcome. But as we climbed around, walked around Ez Rock, I saw the chain going up and all the tourists, and I thought to myself, well, I can't say I've come this far and not have a go. So I started making my way up, and I said to Ellen, I said, look, just so you know, look, I'm just going to just going to go for a quick wander. We'll see what happens. And the further I went up Ez Rock, the more I was like, that inner competitive person me said, go the whole way. But I had no phone on me, so I couldn't connect to Ellen. She had a little nine-month-old of the baby, and so she just saw her husband disappear up the top of Ez Rock. And the further that I went, the further I was determined to get to the top. Some of you need to hear me this so hear me today, some of you might not feel like experiencing God's presence right now, but I tell you what, you just need to take one step. And the further that you take steps, the more you go, I want to be in his presence because when I've experienced his presence, I know that it's worth the hard work to get there. But in that moment, I couldn't go with Taylor and with Ellen because she had just had a baby and there's no way that a little baby was climbing as rock. I had to let them go in order to go up. And after an hour and I came back down, she's like, where'd you go? I think, well... There, at the top there, I went to the top. I couldn't help myself. She knows my nature. And that's my only ever experience of climbing something that's fairly high. And there was some danger on the way up. And whether you're here today or watching your line and you've got a little fascination with all these movies and Netflix shows about people who climb mountains. I don't know if you saw the one about the guy that climbed 28 peaks in 28 days or all the movies about Mount Everest and the conquering of Mount Everest, there is something about the fascination of a human being doing something that you and I probably would never do. You and I probably would never think, I'm going to climb Mount Everest. And so when someone tells us a story through a movie or through a show, there is this human fascination about how on earth did someone have the drive and the intrigue to want to do that? It can feel a little bit like it's for so many people, but... I would never in my wildest dreams imagine that that could be my story. Can I tell you that the presence of God is the opposite of that? The presence of God is not a thing for only a few individuals. The presence of God is available for anyone who calls upon His name and says, I want God to invade my life in a fresh and unique way. You don't have to approach November with a sense of, oh, my life is out of order or the things that only others would know are happening right now. That is the moment where you say, I need to let those things go in order to say, I am starting my, my journey towards the summit of going, God, do something fresh, do something new, stir my spirit, intrigue me in a way that I've never been intrigued. God, do things you've never done before because I am not satisfied with staying at the bottom of the mountain. And so this morning, I want to encourage you that this is for everyone. Everyone, whether you've been to a church service in your life or whether you've been going your whole life, it is for everyone. God wants to meet with you. Are you willing to climb the mountain? Are you willing to climb the mountain? So I've got four things today. Four things that we need to know about mountaintop encounters with God. The first one is this. You have to make the decision to climb the mountain. Now that seems like a really, really straightforward point. But it actually starts with a decision to say, I am going to position myself for an encounter with God. I'm not just going to let this month go by or next six months or the next year. I have to have a heart posture and a heart position that says, God, I want to meet you where you're at. I want to do whatever it takes to have an encounter with you because I'm not satisfied. Last year... I was having a conversation with Joel Bill, and he just threw this line out to me. He said, hey, Joel, next year, would you be interested in climbing to uh, Everest Base Camp with me? And we'd do some fundraising as part of like, you know, helping people bring awareness. And I, my first response was, that'd be great. But when I went home, I thought, what on earth did I just say? <laughs> I looked into it. It's 15 days. I've got asthma. I've never climbed a mountain. So I politely went back and said, can I actually just have a think about that? Because my first reaction was, I want to go up the mountain. But I didn't know what it would look like to go up the mountain because I thought Everest Base Camp, I know it's 5,000 metres, but even just climbing to Base Camp, 
There's some days you can only go 400 meters because of the altitude and because of the, the oxygen deprivation. But there was a willingness in me to say, yeah, I'll go. And I want to encourage you that when it comes to encountering God, even if you don't know the details, you don't know the logistical side of what it looks like to have to bring your kids later on at night and what does that mean for school or whatever it might look like in your quiet time or your quiet space. Because remember, it's not just about a one-size-fits-all approach here. It's saying, God, I'm willing. I'll make a few changes to experience your presence. I'll make a few shifts that could be a bit uncomfortable or to have to let go of a few things in order to experience your presence in a unique way. So there's got to be this real sense in our hearts that I'm willing to climb the mountain. James 4 verse 8 says this, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. There is a response from our heart that says, I am coming towards you, God, and he is there waiting, ready to reciprocate. When you purpose in your heart to pursue God's presence, he won't let you down. When you pursue to draw near to him, the word of God is so clear that he will meet with you. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. What a promise of God's word. It is not a hollow feeling. It is a promise from God to say, I am waiting. I am ready. Would you come towards me? So I want to encourage you during this month, what's it going to look like to make a few challenges in your own internal world to experience him in new ways? The second thing you need to know about mountaintop experiences is that you need to travel light. You need to travel light. Psalm 24 verse 3 says this, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God? If you want to climb a mountain, you can't go up the mountain with excess weight and excess things. Climbing a mountain requires strategic thinking, strategic planning, asking the question of what do I really need to go up this mountain? What do I need to let go of? What is going to be in the way? What sort of food do I need? And what sort of food will be too heavy for that particular step in the journey? And I just wonder when it comes to encountering God, if we're willing to let go of things to go up to the mountain, I wonder what are some things that the Spirit of God might start impressing on our hearts. Even maybe when you walked in here this morning during worship, maybe there was a reminder from the Spirit of God of that unforgiveness that you're holding towards someone right now. Oh, but it's just that. No, no, it's weight. Maybe you're here this morning and there's been an offence that has built up, a misunderstanding. There's been a challenge with a work friend, with someone in church, with a family member, with a spouse. I don't know what's been going on, but I wonder if that offence could keep you at the bottom of the mountain. I wonder if that offence would weigh you down to the point that you want to go up there, but you're not willing to do the hard work to get there. Because if I'm not willing to let go, how can I go up? How can I walk into God's presence uncluttered and unencumbered? with the things that he said you need to forgive. Let go of the offense. Don't get distracted. Don't let those things become a, a, a temporary thing, become an eternal matter. What is it in our life right now that maybe the Spirit of God's been saying, that thing that's become an addiction, give it to me. That offense that is now built into bitterness and has caught root in your heart, let it go. That thing you heard about a person that you don't even know if it's real or not, but you've got an offence for someone else now as a result of it or that direction or that idea, let it go. Because if you want to encounter the presence of God, you need to come in light. I wonder if there's a heaviness right now that you can't shake because you won't give it to God and you've been trying to hang on to or something that really is not yours to hang on to. The Bible is clear. His burden is, his lo- so his yoke is light and it, we're to give our burdens to Him at the cross. I just wonder if maybe we've got around the wrong way and we're hanging on to the burdens and we're not giving them over. How do we go to the mountaintop if I'm 20, 30 kilos overweight from what I need to be in order to get to where I need to get to? I wonder if guilt, shame, distractions, maybe other things have become your idol. Money, your business, another person, sport, God forbid. Your television. There are so many things that could just tip us over the edge to not be able to get that last 
sense that God, I'm ready, I'm ready to let those things go in order to go up. Father, I ask right now in this room, with every eye closed, the Holy Spirit, you would drop in every person's heart, those online, any distraction or any offense or any unforgiveness that God, you need to deal with at the bottom of the mountain, speak now. Show that picture of that person. Move in only ways that you can move, Father, because we need to live light. We need to move nimble so we can move in what you're saying, God. We can't be like a big cruise ship that's stuck in port and can't move. God, if we're going to experience your presence, God, I pray, reveal in each heart what needs to stay at the bottom of the mountain. Please, Father, we want to draw near to you. We want to go up. So we ask that, Lord, you would let us, let it go. Amen. I know for me, when we started this church, there were two things specifically I've shared about them that God asked me to let go of in order to go up. I did those things, and 11 years on, I can tell you, I don't regret for a moment letting go of those things that were natural desires, but they weren't where God needed me to go. There were some things that God needed for me to pick up, but I couldn't pick those things up while I was still dealing with things that God had told me to let go of. Someone needs to write this down this morning. You can't pick up the new things that God is wanting to give you while you are still holding on to the old things that God has told you to let go of. Let me read that again. And by the way, there's no quote at the end because I wrote this. You can't pick up the new things God is wanting to give you while you are still holding on to the old things that God has told you to let go of. What is it that God has clearly spoken to you to let go of that you are still hanging on like a little teenager or a little pesty little three or four year old toddler that won't let go of their safety blanket or their comfy blanket because they just won't let go when God's saying, let go. You know why? Because the fear is if I let go, what will happen next? I'll tell you what happened. God will give you something new to hold. God will give you something new to be responsible for. God will speak in new ways to increase the gifting in your life. I'm telling you, if you're willing to let go when God speaks, you watch what God can do when he gives you the new. The third thing that you're going to need on this mountaintop adventure is to know that not everyone will be able to go where you're going. We see in this story that Peter, James and John went with Jesus up the mountain, but guess what? That was only three out of the 12 that were hanging with Jesus. Not everyone that was on Jesus' discipleship list was able to go up the mountain. He had an assignment and a special assignment for just the three of them. And so while three went up, it meant 25% made it up the mountain with him and 75% were at the bottom, offended, upset, maybe eating too much. I don't know what they would, how they would dealt with their concerns. We don't know what happened in that moment. All we know is that Jesus said, you, 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 we're going up. Not everyone can go where God wants you to go. Listen to me carefully. There are some friends in your life that they masquerade as good for you, but they will limit what God can do to speak to you. There are even people with great connect groups around them that have got comfortable and God's been speaking something different to you because when you get to the mountaintop, there's a conviction that God wants to birth in you. But the problem is that while you're happy to be comfortable, God can't speak. Not everyone can go where God wants to take you. This is one of the hardest things I've had to learn in the life of this church as the church has kept growing, that I can't stop for one moment turning around and go, is everyone okay? Is everyone comfortable? Are we all feeling good? Because when God keeps moving the fire forward and God keeps moving His presence forward and I've got to keep pursuing where God's going, it can offend some people and it can hurt some people because they say, what about me? Well, keep pursuing the presence of God for yourself. Keep getting up the mountain, live light, live unoffended. Keep forgiving, keep moving in that direction because when God's moving and God's speaking, keep going. We cannot get stuck in seasons because God did things one way that He's going to do it in the new way. Guess what? Post-COVID, church is different. Life is different. And if you haven't taken a stock take on the people that you surround yourself with, you may have come here from another church and due to comfort, it's easy to hang out with the people you used to go to church with. But God's waiting to do some new things in you. But while you're still hanging out with those people, He can't do the new thing because it's comfortable and it's easy. But God's saying, would you trust me? Maybe there's a whole group of people that need to go up the mountain together. And say, so, you know what? Maybe back down there, it wasn't great, but we're going to keep on moving up the mountain together because I refuse to stay the same and in this place. 
What would happen if you made some tough calls to say, I need to get some new friends around me because I am committed to God's presence over my comfort? What would happen if God started to stir your life to say, if I'm willing to go up, maybe some of my friends would go. If He's going, I'm going. God's looking for leaders. God's looking for Joshua's in this season. God's looking for Caleb's that carry a different spirit and a different sense in their heart to say, I am willing, God, to forgo the comfort. I'm willing to forgo the relationships. I'm willing to say, God, if there is something fresh and something new that's waiting up the mountain, then I will let go of those things in order to pursue God. And it's up to them, whatever happens, they can pursue Him or they won't, but that is not my choice. You might be here today and maybe your spouse is like, well, you can go along tonight. I don't, I'm just going to stay at home. I don't, yeah. Maybe you just got to come. Maybe it's not a team sport tonight. Maybe this month is not a team sport. It's you and God. Because when you get to heaven, he's not going to say, where's your spouse? Come on together. Have a chat. Let's go. Both your passport stamped. Okay, come on in. No, no, no. It's going to be you and God standing before him one day and say, did you come and meet with me? Did you get in my presence? If you have got any sense in your heart right now that what the Scriptures say about end times potentially is being played out right now on a global level and you need to wake up, then listen to me carefully. Now is not the time to be comfortable. Now is the time to get your house in order. Now is the time to get your life in order. Because if God is about to do something fresh and you're on this planet that involves what I read in Scripture, you better be ready. This is not a game. This is not a practice session. God is waiting to encounter you. God is ready to infuse you with dreams and vision. God is getting ready to stir fresh new business ideas. God is getting ready to stir up those that maybe their gifts have become dormant. God say, would you meet with me on the mountaintop? Would you come ready for a fresh, fresh encounter? Not like last year, not like back in 2010, not like at the Rodney Howard Brown Convention back in 90. I'm talking about something fresh and brand new for a new day and a new season for what God's got for you. Hebrews 12 verse 1 and 3 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Here's what I found over the years. The entanglement is often people because the people lead me to sin. Let me say it again. Often the entanglement is the people that I'm around because it's the people I'm around that slow cook me like a frog and I end up sitting like them. Either I'm going to choose in my relationships to be the thermostat and not the thermometer. I'm not here to measure the spiritual temperature of my friends. I'm here to set the group of friends that I'm around, my family, those I'm in my workplace. I'm the one to turn the heat up in the kitchen. I'm the one to say, hey, let's not settle for where we're at as a friendship group, as a, as, a, as a married couple, as a workplace that believes in Jesus. Whatever's going on in your life or in your world, be the thermostat and not the thermometer. You're not here to measure the temperature. You are here to set the place on fire. And the last one, number four. I love this thought that the Holy Spirit wants to be your Sherpa. The Holy Spirit wants to be your Sherpa, or in other words, your guide. John 14 verse 15 says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him, for he dwells within you, and he will be in you. The Holy Spirit is here to guide, to bring comfort, to draw us into the presence of God, to remind us what we need to let go of, to bring great wisdom. On May the 29th, 1953, every New Zealander in the room would know that date. It's probably the most famous Kiwi in history, inside of Richie McCall. A man by the name of Sir Edmund Hillary was the first person to conquer Mount Everest. What was seemingly impossible for any human being became possible. Since that time, there's been hundreds of people that have climbed Mount Everest. But Sir Edmund Hillary got the glory as the first person to conquer Mount Everest. Up until that point, 15 other people had attempted. They are known and had died in the process because of the oxygen, because of the, the lack of understanding of what they were about to face, the weather conditions. 
And what's sad is that often in that particular story is that it's not a fair account of what's real. Because it wasn't just Sir Edmund Hillary that climbed Mount Everest. There was another man that often does not get much glory. You may have heard his name, but often we don't associate it to say that he was the first man with Sir Edmund Hillary. And it was a young Nepalese Sherpa by the name of Tenze Norgo. And I know that over years that maybe that has changed a little bit, but it's not fair to think that only one man was first and maybe it was in the order they stepped, but there were two men that went together to conquer something that seemingly was impossible. Tenze Norge brought local guide knowledge of what the conditions would hold, carried the food, and even in the 15 minutes they spent on the peak, he was the one that took the photo. Listen to me carefully today, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. The Holy Spirit is our guide. The Holy Spirit wants us to draw us into the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings knowledge that maybe at times you think, where did that come from? Or wisdom in moments where you don't know what to do. Maybe if you're going through pain right now or there's been some challenges, the comfort of the Spirit of God. I imagine when Sir Edmund Hillary was getting close to the top and he said, we can do this. There's an opening in the weather, we can go. It was that comfort and that sense of like, if you're saying we can do this, let's go. Because without the Sherpa, maybe he was like, ah, just like the other 15 people who died, I don't know if we can do this. And so history goes to tell the story that this young Nepalese Sherpa was just as important. And why he maybe didn't get the glory without Tenzin Norge, maybe Sir Edmund Hillary was just another name on a list of people who died climbing Mount Everest. If you think you can do life alone, if you think you can conquer the mountains that life brings your way and the valleys that you walk through without the Spirit of God, that saddens my heart. Because what I know is this, that when you're filled with the Spirit of God, when He's alive and active, the places that the Spirit of God will guide you and direct you will change you forever. Protection over your family, wisdom for circumstances, knowledge for things you didn't even know was about to happen in your business, discernment in places you couldn't even imagine. But ultimately, just like Sir Edmund Hillary needing someone to help him get to the mountain, I want to tell you the Spirit of God guides us into the presence of God. He reminds us to let let go of those things. Hey, hey, that's a distraction right now, not important. That person you thought would be impossible to forgive when the Spirit of God says, it's time now, let's do that. It is amazing what happens when you allow the Holy Spirit to be your Sherpa and your guide. Would you stand to your feet this morning? You know, tonight when we kick off our 7 p.m. service, the first thing we'll be doing after some worship will be praying for anyone who's never been filled with the Holy Spirit before. It's like a, a great way to start every year to go, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, we'd love to pray for you. It's not a weird moment. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a moment where like it's, it's not a show. It's literally just a moment where the Spirit of God in a faith-filled environment wants to fill people's lives. So I want to encourage you, if you've never been filled with the God's presence, go back to point one. I have to be willing to climb the mountain as a starting point. We're, we're going to be praying for you tonight. We're going to be praying for everyone who comes tonight. We're going to make sure that every person that wants to be prayed for tonight doesn't leave here without someone else praying for them, ministering to them, and allowing for the presence of God to move in your life. So I just want to encourage you that if you've never had that experience, or maybe it's been a while, maybe you're feeling dry tonight, let's come expectant for what God wants to do. That's why we need to create these other spaces. But would you... Just in this moment, would you just close your eyes? Come on, even though they're on, online, unless you're driving, I, I want to encourage you. What, what does the Holy Spirit want to do this month in your life? Are, are, you, are you bold enough to recognize that you're running a bit empty right now? Are you bold enough to realize that maybe things are a bit dry and that maybe you do fit the criteria that I mentioned at the beginning because we're predictable that we're coming to the end of the year where we're busy and there's a lot happening and there's things finishing up and if only the Holy Spirit could just bring a fresh sense in my life right now that maybe next year will look different. Maybe the Holy Spirit just wants to bring hope where right now things look hopeless. 
faith where at the moment you've had fear gripping your heart. I wonder today at the start of November, if you'd just be willing to say, come Holy Spirit. So I want to pray for you this morning. I just would love every person that's watching online and everyone that's here just to lift your hands right now as a sign of a willingness to say, I'm willing to go up the mountain. I'm willing to explore what God could do afresh and new in my life. I wonder today if you were being honest and you were running a bit empty, a bit dry, that you would just go, God, fill me afresh. Come on, right through this room with every eye closed. Just start to just take a moment and just you, you start to tell God, God, I love you. God, I need you. Spirit of God, fill me afresh. Prepare my heart. Come on, right through this room, a faith-filled church that starts to just declare His goodness. Stretch your hands to heaven in an act of surrender saying, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fill me afresh. Holy Spirit, don't let me stay the same. Holy Spirit, remind me of those things that need to be left behind. Holy Spirit, right in this room right now, from every person, from front to back, left right, those online, stir our hearts, Father. Stir our hearts. Let hunger rise in this place. Come with every eye closed this morning, I want to pray for one last group of people. I want to pray for anyone that's here this morning that does not know Jesus. Maybe you never thought that you were even allowed to go up the mountain to meet with God. Maybe you've never heard that He's for you and He's not against you, that He wants to forgive you. The Bible tells us in Romans 10 verse 9, if I believe in my heart and confess through my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that I will be saved. It's making that conscious decision to say, God, if you're real, if your son did die for me because I could never pay that, pay that price and only he could, and that it's in that moment of saying that I do believe that he did die and he rose again and that I'm choosing the word surrender. I'm choosing to say, I give my life to you. It's not my own. I want to know what you want for my future. I'm letting you take the wheel. I want your forgiveness in my life, but I also want to know that you have got my eternity in your hands. With every eye closed this morning, if that's you this morning saying, hey, I want Jesus in my life right now, give me a wave right through this room. Man, there's hands going up everywhere today. Come on, let's praise Jesus for every person right now. Come on. Come on, give me a wave if you say, that's me, Joel. I want Jesus this morning. Come on, give me a wave right now. All these hands that are going up everywhere around the room. We love that. Come on, church, we love seeing people's lives change. His presence is here today. Never think that the Holy Spirit will not lead people up the mountain to His presence. Come on, we're going to pray this prayer together from front to back, left to right. Then we're going to worship Him. We're going to go bigger, right? We're going to go big, 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 Bronte. God's going to heal your arm at the same time. Are we ready to pray? Jesus, Jesus today, today, I invite you, I invite you into, my life. into my life. Would you forgive me, would you forgive me of, all of, my sin? of all of my sins? And would you take my past and, would you take my past and exchange it for your future? Exchange it for your future. I believe, I believe that, you died that you died and that you rose again. And, that you rose again. and from this day forward, this day forward I, am I am gonna follow you in you. Jesus' in mighty Jesus name. Mighty Amen. Come on, church, just give him, give him a shout of praise. Come on, every hand lifted higher this morning. Well, if you did pray that prayer for the first time or to rededicate your life to Jesus, and we would love to invite you to jump onto glowchurch.com where there are three steps that we would love to encourage you to follow. But I'm going to ask Liz to pray that you would have the best week of your life. Yeah. So Father God, we thank you for these amazing people online, that you would bless them as they go about their week. Lord, that you would um, bless them with gifts and surprises this week. Blow their minds with your goodness. Yeah. And we just thank you, Father God, that um, the Holy Spirit is um, gonna encounter them this week in Jesus' name, amen. And have a great week.